All right, hi everyone. My name is Dmitry, and it's the last talk, so rejoice. All right, uh, I'm software engineer at Google. I work on DevTools in general, and the last two years I've been working on build systems. So let's talk about build systems, right? Okay, that's probably was your first encounter with a build system ever. You wrote your your excellent Hello World program in C++, and then suddenly you realize that you actually need to do some more stuff to run it, to, to actually get some results. And that's how you end up, you type these comments once or twice, and then you wrote a little bash script or whatever uh, shell you use to compile your Hello World program. And then you co wrote some more code, and some more code, and some more code, and then suddenly you fed it in second file, right? Uh, that have some utilities that you use in your Hello World program. I don't know what they are, but yeah, you, you just do that, right? And then uh, you, you have been doing that for a while, and then you realize that, well, actually, that bash file is not very nice because sometimes you just touch one of those two files, and then uh, it still rebuilds everything from, from the beginning to the end. And that's how you discover make, right? So you write... And make, you go, you do info make or man make or whatever it is, and you discover a make file. And that's 1970s technology. And you write something like this. And if you really think about what that is, then you, know, you have your dependencies discovered, your main.object file depends on main CC, and there is some, some recipe to build that. Same for util. And then you have a recipe to link them all together, right? And what this actually, what this actually is, is what we in, in, the, in the business of doing builds call an action graph, right? So it's really a graph where you have in this oval things like this and this are files, the artifacts, right? And then in those boxes, you basically have actions, the, the functions, some kind of, or, some kind of things that take some input artifacts and produce some output artifacts. Some of them take one, produce one. Some of them take two, produce one. All kinds of combinations, right? So this is basically a graph. And uh, all the essence of a build system, right, as, as you, I guess, understand for sure, right, is you sort of do the traversal of this graph. You are asked to build this artifact down here, which is a program. And then you walk this graph back, and you discover things that are not up to date, right? And how do you discover that? <clears throat> if, at first, you, you, if you have nothing, then you obviously have to build everything. If you already have this util IO, uh, then you, you see where it comes from. And as long as this doesn't change, and that doesn't change, this doesn't change as well, so you don't have to execute any, any, any of the actions, right? And that, that's, a, that's a basic idea of a build system. And of course, as you've seen today, you can go party with that. You can do things like uh, cache all that locally, cache all that remotely, execute those things remotely, reuse that cache on your machine. You can, uh, of course, you should be able to uh, you should make sure that what you're doing is correct. Therefore, you need to make sure that you sort of store not the modification times, but hashes of the files and stuff like that. Uh, and, and you can go a long, long way optimizing this traversal, discovery of the things you need to update and execution of the things. And we've, we've heard so much today about how you can do this distributed, com this is basically distributed computation, right? So we've heard a lot about how you can make this distributed computation very fast by using, say, special file systems, special like GVS, special... Uh, Schedulers like Jupyter and stuff like that, right? And we at Google spend a lot of time investing in that sort of things, right? Uh, but the key idea remains. The key idea remains that what this is all about is doing less work. You, do, you modify a small part of your application or your source code, and then you only rebuild things that you need to rebuild. That's the key idea behind the whole thing. So for build systems, fast means incremental. That's what it's all about, right? We discover, we minimize the amount of work we need to do. OK, so let's, uh, let's evolve this uh, make file that we did a little bit. Let's now have 
two more utility, uh, two more files that go into your utility thing, and you now have this uh, utilities library, right? So you wrote this make file, you added a new file, and you now, in this step, compile two input files, and then leave, and then archive them together, right? So you did that, and that's your recipe that you gave to the build system. All right, now you, you probably see the problem with that. You are not incremental enough here. You, whenever any of those two files change, you actually recompile both of them and then archive. Uh, and that's not happy. And what you really want to do is this. You actually want to split your make file and have one rule to compile the .o file, one rule to compile another .o file, and then another rule to another target uh, in, in the make parlance to um, uh, archive them together. And here's, here's the deal. Uh, no matter how much hashing and puffing and hashing and caching build system does, uh, as long as you give it this, right, it's going to fail. It's ca it cannot do, uh, do in be in as incremental as, need to, it is as it needs to be, right? So being fast needs knowledge. There is certain knowledge that a uh, build system can be fast and they can do their, their job, but unless you have domain-specific knowledge, programming language-specific knowledge about your build targets, you cannot make, make things really incremental. Okay. So, right. Now, what's the next problem with, with make? You go and edit your make file, and then you make your program, and it says, program is up to date. I don't see any changes. There's nothing I can do. You go and update the C compiler with, uh, with a new version. You have a great compiler. You make your program. Again, it's up to date. Make discovered no dependencies. So what you actually need to write in your make file is this whole list of dependencies. Does, uh, your object, object file does not depend only on your CC file. It's also dependent on the compiler, the standard library, the headers, the make file itself, and maybe some other stuff, right? So another thing that we really want to have here is build system being correct. And correct really mean, means hermetic and reproducible. You really need to know when you build this action graph, uh, what are your real dependencies. Otherwise, you will get stale, stale cache hits, stale results. You will have to do things like make clean, and that would be very, very sad, right? So and another thing that hermetic gives you is uh, reproducibility. If you declare all your dependencies, that you, then you know that you, if you are at a certain point uh, in your revision history, this, and all your dependencies are the same, then the results will be the same. So you can, say, go back in your git history and build from that commit, and you'll get the exact same binary. OK, right? So Hermitist is good. But the problem with, with it, again, is that it's not only the build system's uh, kind of basic uh, uh, algorithms that, that allow you that, you need to know what are those dependencies. And since you need to know what are those dependencies, you need to have, again, language-specific, domain-specific knowledge about what they are. And um, so filling in all those question marks can be quite tricky, especially for C++. If your compiler goes, hand, hand, like, don't get me started on CLXZ and this PCH file thing, <laughs> Right? It goes hunting for like random files in your directories, and, and it can be very tricky to make it behave. All right. So again, being correct, being grammatic, uh, means knowing your dependencies, and mean, that means, again, domain-specific knowledge. All right. So that's all there is to build systems, right? They have to be fast, they have to be correct. So let's talk about build systems. Uh, I work on Bazel. And Bazel is an open source version of Google's own build system. Uh, or it's rather, I would say, it's not an open source version. It is the build system uh, uh, Google used internally. Uh, some parts of it are not yet open source, but it's still the same code base. Right? And it's been in development for maybe about a decade already, maybe eight years. But yeah, I guess decade is right. Uh, it's been only open source about two years ago. And we're still on our way to version 1.0. Right? So uh, what, what Bazel is all about? Frankly, it's, it's very simple in some way, right? It's all about 
principled applications of those two, principle, of two, uh, two ideas that are outlined. It's, a, it's fast because it uses aggressive caching. It does remote execution. Uh, the public version of that is in the works. And uh, internally, Google, we do remote execution for all, all our actions. Uh, we uh, ensure that actions don't go hand in for their inputs. We sandbox them. Uh, and, and successive and principled uh, application of, this, uh, of that design really gets us a very, very long way, right? So good call. OK, we've been comparing code base today. So Google is about 2 billion lines of code. It's one big monorepo. And uh, we build that. People commit things every, every minute. And we build those commits every minute. And we run their tests all the time. It's all continuously integrated. And uh, one testimonial from our internal mailing list. So somebody has been working for six years at Google, never had to do Blaze Clean or Basil Clean. Until for maybe a couple of times when we actually had a bug in Basel. Right. So that's, that's kind of how, that's our recipe for how to scale for big code base. Literally just continuous and uh, principled application of being hermetic and uh, decoding our inputs is, is what gets us there, right? OK, what I want to talk about today uh, or a little bit more, dive a little bit more into is this knowledge part, right? This how do you bring uh, language specific, domain specific knowledge, platform specific knowledge into your build system? And, to, uh, and we, I think we, we are on the way to solving that problem in Basel, and I want to uh, present that uh, solution to you, right? So instead of this is the equivalent of the make file we, we wrote before, uh, but in Bazel, right? In, in Bazel language, uh, you, you, what you do see here is, here is a C++ library named Util. It has two sources, you know, this source and this source. And it has a C binary, which is a which then pro, is program. And it has a, also a source file called MNCC. And this dependency is util. And this thing is what we call a label. So basically, uh, every declaration like this defines what we call a target, right? That target has a name util. And this target has a name program. And they depend uh, between each other using this colon util syntax. That means here's a label refers to this target, OK? What you don't see here. And you don't see any command lines, right? They, they, they are somewhere inside uh, the definition of what CC library and CC binary is. And this is very important, I think. Uh, we really make the user of Bazel, the, the users who need to, to uh, build their projects, define what it means to build their projects in a very semantic way, right? Here's the C library, C binary, that's how they depend. And then, uh, Kind of before we start building and before we start executing, there is a certain amount of conversion that uh, where we go from here to an action graph, right? So uh, this is so we, we sort of we start with what we call a target graph, and this is a target graph. That's pretty much uh, your build file as as we did before, reflected into a graph structure, right? So it's a program dependent depend on util, and then when you, when we need to build uh, this target, for example, we first walk that graph and apply certain transformation to it. We call it analysis. We also call it analyzing this, this target graph to produce uh, the action graph. So, and then every, every kind of target does a certain specific transformation that's, that is uh, uh, sort of uh, that's inherent to it, right? So, for example, the Java library target as defined in the previous slide would produce this kind of target graph, which also has like two inputs, uh, two actions. Here's two outputs, and there is another two, uh, another R high thing. Note, uh, so this is basically uh, what Java library implementation, what Java library uh, translation process does. And note how the user don't have to care about uh, .o files, anything. They just build it, and the, the target uh, transformation process produces the right kind of the most optimal uh, action graph that, that's needed to build this target. 
All right, and then uh, after this first target was, uh, was uh, analyzed and we got this action graph, we can now analyze Java binary target, which also sort of uh, uses its own inputs, like main CC and does the compilation actions and stuff like that. And it also incorporates the output from the result of the analysis of the Java library. And that's how we uh, traverse, traverse the graph from sort of uh, from dependencies to dependent nodes and build this action graph. And of course, all of that can be heavily cached and serialized and stored. Um, and this is very important because now we have this kind of we realize that those recipes, the low-level recipes that they can, the plans for your execution that you need to uh, maybe push, maybe execute, maybe push over to distributed, uh, distributed cluster or something like this, uh, they are tedious to write, and you need some sort of a transformation, some sort of a high-level representation for the user, and during that high-level to low-level transformation during this analysis phase, that's where this. Uh, language-specific knowledge comes in. All this, all this here is a purview of a build system. Build system works as that, right? And users give us those high-level descriptions of their projects. And then these red uh, arrows here on the previous slide represent the language-specific knowledge that we somehow capture and use in the build system. All right. So uh, let's see how it actually works. So that previous file was kind of lie. Before we do, uh, users need to load definitions of those CC library and CC binary uh, entities that, that they can use to um, describe their project. So let's take a look at what, what are those things, what those things actually are. What's CC library and CC binary? So first of all, uh, here's a definition of those, those two things. We call them rules, right? And uh, this pretty much defines the user interface for, for those rules. And uh, these things are also defined in a file called DCBCL, and that's a language similar to, but not quite, Python. Uh, and, um, right, and then you can see here that these, these uh, rules have attributes that's the so sources, which are list of labels and th that are low files as well. And depths are also list of labels. And another thing you see here is this CC tool chain thing. And that's an uh, implicit dependency that every CC library has on C++ tool chain, on C++ compiler, and other tools associated with that. Right? And that is where this hermeticity thing that I was talking about earlier comes in. I didn't show this uh, toolchain tool dependency on my sort of action graphs because that would clutter them. But uh, basically, they're all there. All those actions have this implicit input, which is a CC toolchain. And this toolchain is also a label. So you can actually redefine that and point you to, that to your own toolchain as well. All right? Uh, right. And then, so that, that's the user interface. And then the meat of this transformation, the analysis that, that lets us go from uh, the user-defined entity to what build system works with, that happens inside what we call an implementation, right? And implementation is, is really a function whose uh, purpose in life is to build those action subgraphs, right? So let's see, for the, here, is, here for CC library implementation, uh, its goal is to build this compilation subgraph that I showed you earlier, right? So uh, what happens here is that this guy is one of those oval nodes that you create through some creation thing. Then you create an action, that's a box. That's how you create a box. And these inputs are the incoming edges. Well, it is one edge in this case. Outputs is another is an outcome in edge, and uh, executable is just another kind of edge, which is, from point of view of build system, is treated the same. It's just as the different uh, nice um, API to, to build those, those kind of graphs. And there's arguments, and arguments are obviously just your normal uh, C++ compiled arguments, right? And then, uh, so the, here, here the same happens uh, for the actual output, the library, where you sort of, we've built this, 
first part of the graphs, which is compiling the files, and then we build this library thing, which, which archives it, right? Uh, right? So, okay, here, here's the library thing. And more, most importantly, uh, the CC library can propagate some information about what happened to the uh, to its dependencies. Here, for example, we say that CC library returns this CC information, and its output is this library. Now, when CC, uh, now here's an implementation for CC binary rule, and that rule will need, will need to link some libraries. How will how we know them? It will use the information that this CC binary provided inside this data structure we call provider. And you, you can get the CC information, you get an output, and that's how you collect all the files you, you need to link, okay? So that's a nutshell how you build uh, those graphs. It's, it's a nice kind of imperative-ish code that's uh, not too terrible to understand, I hope. Uh, and then uh, one other thing that, that's, that's nice about this CC info thing is that this uh, data structure here defines the interface between different kinds of rules. In this case, CC library gave some information to CC binary that, OK, I, I'm a rule. I'm producing a library, and you can link that library. And it's CC library because you, you have a CC information. Uh, but then again, somebody could come, come and write, go and write Go library implementation. And Go libraries can be linked into CC libraries as well. So Go library would, you know, it would do its Go magic, but it will also return the CC information that can then be linked into the CC binary, the C++ binary code. So that's how you do language inter interoperability. You suddenly just, well, CC binary can link in any library as long as that library knows how to output, how to output archives, right? And the same goes on the other side with CC binary. Uh, CC binary, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, you can do a, a Go binary as well. And the Go binary can now uh, link in CC binaries as well because the interface is defined. This is CC info thing. And if, if the dependency provides CC info information, then you can link in uh, that binary. You know it's a C binary that produces CC, uh, C++ thing that produces the library that you can link in. All right. OK, let's, so let's talk about this language that we use. Uh, so historically, it's been Python. Our build, build language was Python before. And we, what we did uh, is we uh, cut a lot of stuff out of Python. There are no classes. There are no, no, a lot of other things that don't support. There's no reflection. And, uh, but it's still fundamentally Python, right? It, it, has, it has the same uh, syntax, pretty much the same semantics, and the build-specific concepts are injected as a standard library that's a part of, a, part of an environment in which that thing is ex executed. And also, uh, because we do this massively parallel graph reductions, uh, all these implementation functions need to be executed uh, in such a way that they can be executed in parallel. So the way we do it is that uh, we have data that is locally mutable. While you're inside that implementation function, you can mut mutate things. But everything that is exposed from that function is, is just frozen. So you can, cannot modify that. And that means that you can execute things in parallel, right? Uh, so I think this uh, language has been, uh, has been really uh, doing us a lot of uh, good service. It's much easier to write rules. They, they have well-defined semantics. Uh, the language seems to be very nice for developers, so, so they like it. And then, uh, so our current state here is that we have a lot of uh, uh, rule definitions that are developed either by, uh, Google's, uh, by Google employees or by the, by the community. You can see some lists here. Unfortunately, we have been migrating to Skylark only since maybe three years ago. And then a lot of rules that we, ha that we, do, uh, that we have in Bazel, especially for co specifically for core languages, Java and C++ and also for Android, are, are still not Skylark. Right, um, and that was actually 
uh, causing us trouble when we tried to modify those rules. It was, they were really, uh, they made a lot of assumptions about how the build system works that were not captured in any kind of API. So our goal for uh, Basil 1.0, which happens soonish, I guess, year, in a year maybe, uh, is uh, stable Scalar KPIs, both for those rules and also for rule writers, for people who, uh, uh, who develop new rules, so that those can be easily uh, kind of uh, supported throughout the lifetime of Basil and, and easily added to, right? All right, so our aspiration is this, is that all the language-specific information about uh, your languages, your platforms, should be encoded in Skylark, right? That's a, that's a very, very powerful knowledge, and we cannot, uh, we cannot build an efficient build system unless we really have that knowledge. Because if you don't, then you either introduce non hermeticity or you introduce inefficiencies, you will not explo exploit incrementality or too much incrementality, so things will go wrong unless, unless you kind of, for every language you support, you sort of dive into this uh, language-specific knowledge. So knowledge of language-specific knowledge, domain-specific knowledge is power, and it's funky because every, every new language has a different ideas about how it needs to build itself, right? So uh, let me leave with that. Build systems are different. And frankly, if your system is not fast and correct in this day and age of hugely massively uh, parallel, uh, massive, massive code bases of z zillions and zillions of lines, as we heard today from three, four companies, five, I think, they have all have huge code bases. If your system is not fast and correct, why would you use it, right? Alternatives exist, and, and, and you should really switch. Uh, and uh, having builds that are not reproducible, it's just a disservice for, for companies operating at scale. And these build systems are different, and they should, should do best what they do best, which is here's an action graph, here's what I need to execute. Execute it, figure it out, uh, distribute, uh, distribute the work, make it fast, make it incremental, make it optimal, right? But then, uh, all of those build systems at, at this point of time need to solve this other problem of language-specific knowledge that every build system that I know of needs to bake it anew into, into its core, right? And ba Basil is no exception. And here's my question then. I leave you with that. Can it be shared? Can it be shared between build, the build system? When you're a language designer, if, if we say language designers, when you design a language, give us rules to build your code, maybe that will make language designers think about their language design choices, and then they design better languages for us. Like, for example, C++ modules versus header files, right? So, uh, and I do hope that maybe, my, my hope is that eventually Skylark, or something like Skylark, might be a basis for this uh, common knowledge, knowledge that's common to all the build tools that people are developing today because Google's mission is to make information universally accessible and useful. Thank you.